just need to check that my mouse is also moving. Uh, oh, we are now live. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, <laughs> obviously, my microphone is not on, um, but that is fine. All right. Um, we are current. We are now presenting you how this whole world was built in the time span of four months. Uh, that was a, a long process with a lot of people involved, and uh, we want to guide you through that process and explain step, step by step how this idea came to life and how we managed to uh, get that all together for you to enjoy. And not only those uh, three days now, because um, this whole project, Virtual Ferns, is an independent project from a certain con. So we are an independent group of people. Uh, we are not paid or anything. We are not affiliated with any convention. Um, this was done here to stay. And the idea is to have a space where people can meet every day and they can uh, spend every day they want. So this convention will never end. And it will also be uh, here for future events. If any certain con wants to use this space, uh, they are free to do so, uh, free to contact us and then use the tools that we use for our event, like uh, for the dance competition yesterday, where we had a streaming desk and stuff like that. So um, you now see a few people from our core team here, but um, the team behind Virtual Ferns is a lot bigger. Uh, we cannot put everyone into the stream because, um, yeah, if your stream is OBS live, the frame rate is already an issue. I get stable 60 FPS now. Uh, more avatars would uh, mean less FPS for you. Uh, however, I want to guide you step by step. So let's start where this all started. It was basically when I got into VR, uh, when I realized that uh, VR has a lot of uh, possibilities that are simply not uh, met by the, the real life. So, so you cannot be your, uh, your favorite avatar in VR. Uh, like you can be, uh, uh, you cannot be your favorite avatar in real life, uh, like you can be in VR. And uh, part of that is also because of, uh, yeah, physical limitations. So you cannot be a skeleton if you want to. Um, you cannot be a Pine Martin. I mean, you can technically have a fursuit, but uh, look at this. Look at this. It's animated and uh, uh, he can move the mouse and make emotes and stuff like that, which is really, really hard in fursuit. But in VR, it's totally possible. And all those dynamic bones as well. Um, so just a lot of things are possible in here and it's way cheaper. Uh, obviously not getting into VR, that's uh, that's an entry price. But then you can attend a con for free. Isn't that amazing? So um, to make this all happen, uh, two years ago, I, had, um, I, ha I saw the need for like having virtual events. Um, because like being in VR for myself also is like, I can finally like look how I want to look like. And that is not possible in real life, at least not that easy. And uh, yeah, so I wanted to have virtual cons and I just realized that uh, spending time with friends in VR is so much more valuable. Now, for people who never experienced VR, I understand that it's like, it's really hard to understand um, what that actually means to, uh, yeah, just, just to be in VR. And uh, if I look around me, like, I feel like I'm really here. And that is something that's hard to describe for people who maybe know like Google Cardboard or uh, 3D Movie, um, because it's not to it's not like that. It's really like being here. I can like physically see everything around me, and that is just uh, amazing. So with with one single click, I can uh, load another world and be somewhere else with my friends. And also a big part for me was like, I hate physical limitations. So I wanted to have a world where you can just fly around on my broom. And that is now possible. So yeah, <laughs> that was that was the reason for me to just uh, to, to start um, getting into VR and start um, also a little bit of developing. But uh, I'm, I'm not good enough for doing 3D modeling stuff myself. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to start like like virtual ferns as a project. I, I think my character mouse is still not moving, which is kind of painful for me to watch. Um, but uh, not much I can do now about that. Um, so so in March I wanted to um, to start uh, this virtual convention now. Uh, the, the idea is way older, but uh, during the pandemic, finally, like a lot of people also saw the need and they slowly started to get into VR and they started to. 
um, also want to get on the project because everyone was stuck at home and uh, suddenly there was a lot of extra time um, that wouldn't be possible without that. And so this pandemic is really also responsible for us to to take the step into uh, virtual con because otherwise I, I don't think people would have that much motivation um, to get started with it. So that was actually something positive. Um, so we, we just uh, started to do the best out of it and we started to um, get people on board. Um, now, one of the first people I got on board was uh, Hayu. Um, he's now driving around on the Roomba that he also modeled, by the way. And uh, Hayu is uh, very experienced with uh, building the Archet worlds and also uh, with, uh, yeah, just 3D modeling and optimization. Because this project, and that is something you need to understand, is crushing every possible limit, not only in VR chat, but especially also in the VR industry. It's like um, having a world with so many details and so many like like assets, different uh, kind of things uh, on that scale and being in there with multiple people. It's just something that uh, the, the world hasn't seen yet, I think. And uh, if you if you visit other VRChat worlds, you understand that. Uh, normally they are like very small and don't have so many different things and assets and uh, it's very optimized. And we still wanted to have that giant world because uh, we wanted to recreate the exact feeling of being here. And that's just that needs those level of details. Um, Hayo, maybe you can step front in front of uh, uh, here and uh, just explain what got you motivated to jump onto the team. Thank you. Yeah, um, very early on in the year, uh, I, I realized um, that we would have some kind of a need for a thing like this. Uh, and, you know, I've been talking to a few friends who were also 3D modelers or perhaps, you know, not, not really 3D modelers, but more into sort of entertainment side of things. And we kind of uh, had a few false starts with a few different groups. Um, but then uh, Rimajo messaged me one day, um, actually it's exactly four months and two days ago. Uh, no, four months and one day ago. And he said, hey, I'm looking to make a virtual con. Uh, would you be interested? And I'm like, wow. I know that you're a person who gets stuff done, and um, it was just like, yeah, let's, let's, let's go full ahead. I've already been looking into this stuff. Um, and, you know, uh, I especially am glad that we started on this project, uh, because toward the end of it, I was starting to really feel that sort of, I wish I was at Euroference, I wish this was still happening, but felt really uh, comforted by the fact that we were making a virtual version of this. Um, so... Uh, yeah, on, you know, we needed to put something together quickly for a video way back in April and I, I thought, you know what, if we can just settle on one little part of the reception to start with, I can make that in a day. Um, and so uh, I pumped that one out, um, a, you know, a couple of people on our small team of around six people at the time, uh, I believe Wolvini made, was it Wolvini or someone made the, the, the paintings and stuff to put on the wall of the reception and then we uploaded that and, uh, and we filmed our little video. Um, and since then, you know, we opened up to a lot of volunteers. We had a lot of people contribute their 3D modeling work. Unfortunately, not everything could be used because it had to be... We were looking for really, really high performance here. Everything needs level of detail versions of the models that have less polygons as you walk further away from them. We had to really try and do a lot of material reuse. So like, you know, we use the same steel for the signs, for parts of the elevators, for many other objects in the scene, for example, and, and just trying to sort of take advantage of all the different techniques you can do to make something run well. Um, yeah, I'm showing right now on the screen, like like uh, our first, uh, let, let me say, like this is the first thing I saw and this is how I, ex I expected the project to look like in the end. I would have been fine with that, but uh, then we saw this and it looks so photorealistic and uh, that was a huge motivation also to get new people on board of this. And uh, This is what we published in the first build and from there on it went, uh, yeah, just uh, further and further. Yeah, and um, I mean, ma making that little area of the reception there, you know, we have what, like th three or four different materials like five different models that's about it the apple is the only thing in the main lobby that isn't our own work um and uh yeah it, it is uh you know scaling up from something that that small little reception 
where it wasn't quite perfectly proportioned. It, you know, the, the height of the reception desk was a bit wrong. The ceiling was, was too low down, a few things like that. And then trying to like actually make the whole thing be accurate to the dimensions of the real hotel, which um, remind Cleaner Wolf, you did most of the work with that, getting the proportions right and things like that. Like that, that makes it, that makes it way harder, but uh, much more of a challenge that we want to rise up to, because then if you can get it right, it, it's, you know, really, it's important for the people who've been to the con. And I think even more funny is there's people who've been here that have never been to Euroference. When they go to the real con for the first time, after being in the virtual one, I, I wonder what that's going to feel like for them. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to uh, whatever tweets come out of that. Yeah, um, let's go step by step. So after we got the reception out, it was clear to us, is my mouse not moving? Still not? Oh, yes, now it's moving. Amazing. Your mouse is also not moving. That would be nice if you could activate that. Um, <laughs> maybe, it's also, maybe it's also my problem, but uh, yeah. Let me look at my own camera here. I should be moving it. Uh, <laughs> I, I've got movement here. I think you muted oh. me. That's why it's not. Mm, I muted whole well, Archer, but it moved for a second. Um, ah. <laughs> we can also switch audio to VRChat. I, I think moving mouse is, an, is a very important feature in VRChat, actually. But then you have less, <laughs> less good <gasps> I saw it moving. People are giving me invites to this world. They, they want to join. No, deny. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so let's let's jump uh, like a little bit forward in time. So it was clear that we need more reference pictures. And when we started this and published the small lobby, uh, the, the Astral Hotel like realized what we were doing, and they were like retweeting us and saying nice things about it. And that enabled us to approach them again because we contacted them before the project and didn't got any reply. And then we had to resend the email and uh, finally got a reply. And uh, they invited us to, to go there and take as many pictures as we want. And it was during a pandemic, so the whole hotel was completely empty. Um, so what we did is we walked into the hotel, uh, we got access to a lot of rooms, and we took one picture, like each, each half a meter <laughs> in the whole hotel, <laughs> and just to have as much references as possible as possible because you don't want to drive home it was quite a long way you don't want to drive home and realize oh, i didn't have a picture of that trash can or of that toilet <laughs> so <laughs> we just um, pictured everything and we also uh, did uh, laser measurements so i had a laser measurement thingy and i just measured everything like ceiling heights and door heights and so on and um, like also took a picture I, I learned that so it was a learning curve for us we have never never done that before uh we we thought we would need to underexpose photogrammetry bad decision <laughs> we had to edit eleven thousand pictures to make them brighter <laughs> afterwards <laughs> which is a job that caillou uh, did and uh, he will also show us in a second how that looks like um so yeah uh, a, a few learning things there. Also, another thing I learned is that measurements on paper have no value at all. Um, <laughs> so what I did is like um, I I t took the measurements, took a picture of the measurement thing, display, and then took another another picture where you see where it's standing and where it's projecting on, and that was so much more useful than anything you could could have written down on paper. Um, uh, another thing that we learned is um, for photogrammetry, you really have to like do small steps and cover everything and not have any sudden jumps in it. And because we learned that afterwards, we had to um, convert multiple picture sets or like in individually and then uh, join that, merge that together afterwards. Uh, it's a very painful I process. Have no idea. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, oh my God. I, I do want to uh, get now into photogrammetry and I would like to see Freeborn who not only like like he did the, the photogrammetry stuff not alone so also clean the wolf please here so those two guys um, um, on the on the first time in the astral was me doing measurements and some reference pictures cleaner wolf took reference pictures and uh, then Cam Sirius was also there and also helped taking reference pictures and then in the end we had two people freeborn and cleaner wolf um, processing those image files 
after Kaiju, who please also step in front of you now, um, edited them all by hand. 11,000 pictures. And that is not batch editing. That is per picture doing adjustments to which area should be brighter or denoise and things like that. Amazing. Um, so maybe you could quickly uh, guide us through the process and I will play back any video files I can find to that. Can you guys hear me? Some yes. yes. Jeff? Okay, so... Um, so basically, photogrammetry is a process of doing 3D scans of real-world objects, rooms, or whole buildings based on a series of photos. Um, there is now a free and open source software that can do that. It's called Meshroom. If you want to try it yourself, download it, play around with it. However, the photos have to be made in a specific way. Um, yeah, they have to overlap and they have to be uh, the, ex the exposure has to be correct and also you have to uh, involve some kind of parallax so that the software tries to find out in the uh, post-processing the depth of everything because a single photo has no depth but a series of photos if you have parallax in it the software can try to figure out how uh, deep everything is, where everything is, and um, but there are limitations to this process because, for example, uh, reflections or transparencies are not, uh, re uh, cannot be recreated at all in photogrammetry because the algorithm gets um, confused by the reflections. And But even in a perfect case, if you have uh, enough detail on the surfaces and there are no reflections and everything, the result can still look quite messy. The mesh will have a lot of polygons. So in a game engine, you would never use the photogrammetry result directly. So what we did is we did the photogrammetry meshes that were then used as a reference to remodel everything uh, you know, with clean topology and with as less polygons uh, as possible. So this is what uh, I did with the lobby. I tried to recreate uh, the lobby in uh, uh, with photogrammetry and then did it in multiple steps and tried to align and fit everything together in Blender afterwards. And it really helped to see uh, the proportions of different objects, the distance between different objects, and that made it much easier to um, yeah, find out where everything is and uh, to have a better overview uh, over everything. So it's like, yeah, basically like a 3D reference photo. You can move around in, in your 3D software and see what, what is happening. <laughs> So that helped a lot. And I think, um, yeah, we needed a lot of time to post process all the photos and also the photogrammetry itself is a very computing intensive task. But I think it was uh, worth it to do that in addition to the normal reference pictures and all the uh, measurements that uh, I margined it. So that's, yeah, from my side about the photogrammetry process. Do we have to add something freeborn? Um, I'm just showing real quick how we uh, took the pictures. And after that, I want to also play back the video, which I just found on the FTP. I wasn't sure where you put it, um, but definitely want to also show that. So what you see right now is uh, how we had to take the picture like step by step and as close together as possible to allow the software to recreate um, those uh, meshes correctly. So how you take the pictures is very, very important um, because it's very hard to fix that in post. Um, now, I will play back the photogrammetry clip that you gave me. And in the meantime, um, I think Freeborn can uh, talk a bit about the process. Yeah, so, well, you covered it pretty well yourself. Um, some new things that I learned uh, was uh, coming from like, a computer vision perspective, you never edit photos, or if you do, you, you do the same exact edit to all of them. So that was, was very interesting learning that. 
you edit them individually, you can you edit the raws individually, you can really save a project that way. So indeed. Um when you talk about editing, Kaiju, do you want to show the editing process? Yes, I will join soon. I have to start uh, Lightroom. Okay. So what I basically did wasn't extremely hard, but wasn't extremely easy because the pictures, like not really all of them, but most of the pictures were taken when the light wasn't really good. So it was really dark or not so dark. And this created a lot of noise, uh, image noises in the pictures. And it was not quite easy to edit, knowing that I have to denoise the pictures, but I also have to keep like uh, at least 70 or 80 percent of the quality of the textures and clarity. So I did adjust the mostly the lightning highlights, shadows, and I mostly have to keep like a white balance in all the pictures because from what I saw, the Israel has many yellow lights and wasn't really good for the rendering or for creating a mesh file. I hope that is correct, the mesh file. Yes. Uh, what you see right now on screen is, by the way, the, the mesh file, but it's not only one scan. Um, those are multiple scans uh, merged together. And uh, it's basically, um, it's, it's not possible to do one photo scan of the whole hotel, which would have been way too easy if that is possible. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> <laughs> but instead we had um, a couple like 20 different scans um, that we had to align properly and towards the outer bounds uh, they start to get less accurate and they start to generate a lot of mesh that you don't want to have there and uh, that had to be all cleaned up by hand it took quite some time uh, we spent weeks on uh, that um, on that cleanup that was uh, was uh, cleaner wolf did cleaning those meshes, uh, putting them all together into one big scene and aligning them properly, which was super hard. And uh, yeah, so uh, are you ready, Kaju, to show a little bit of the editing process? Yes, I will screen share in one moment. Okay. I'm the only one who cannot see Kaiju in VR anymore. Um, I had to close VR chat because <laughs> I had I have all the pictures in one project and this is taking like all my processing, yeah. all my performance. So I had to close VRChat or most likely I was going to crash or my PC was going to crash. Yeah, this scene is uh, so large that even the, the reduced mesh of the photogrammetry scans uh, was not able to open on a PC without 64 gigabytes of RAM. <laughs> so <laughs> that just straight crashed Windows when you wanted to load the textures for that. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> so I'm okay. I'm screen sharing. I also don't have all the pictures in one in this specific project. I have like half, I think, like 4,000 because all of them will not will refuse to open. So I just I just split them. But I think the best de decision was just to make spe specific catalogs for specific um, zones of the hotel. All right, you are now an output. So someone. Um, who a photographer who edits the pictures knows what I did and what I'm doing in the Lightroom. I mean, a photographer that edits their pictures. So I had to edit mostly the lights and the shadows. And keep in mind the textures when I denoise, because when you denoise, the the quality of the pictures will just go like bleached. Or uh, yeah, it will not be really good to see or will not look really good on the rendering. So on the left, it's the normal picture that I think it's from the wing for, but I'm not sure because I haven't been to hotel. So I had to increase the lightning because some spots that are really dark or not so dark, they are not going to be rendered in the um, program, in the mushroom, I think it's called. So I also have to keep in mind the white balance on all the picture, except the parts where it wasn't focused on the rendering, like this side here. I 
it, most of the parts that are not focused on the rendering, I didn't focus on that because it's not important. And I um, start with, f first I start from up and down on the basic. The basic is basically the like, everything you want to edit on the picture except, except the, the colors. The tone curve, which is also important for the shadows, highlights, exposure, and shadows. And I had to denoise in the details. We're using the, the noise reduction. I couldn't increase the luminance too much because it's going to just bleach the picture. And I had to increase the details. Um, but keeping that in mind, this is not like I, I could only reduce 70 or 80% of the noise image, but it was good from what, what Freeborn told me from the results. So I just keep in mind these specific settings. Um, I have different settings for most of the pictures because I had to edit all the pictures by hand. And I sometimes just use the gradient filter, which is a spotlight, which I also use to denoise a little bit, but it wasn't well quite too good for some pictures. I had some pictures where I had to use it six times, seven times only to get like a good light or a good uh, white balance in between the pictures. So I can explain what every settings does, if that's okay. Um, well, I don't want to go too much into detail. I just want to give the viewer an idea how much you, like you had to do that per picture. And uh, uh, obviously, because also like we are never we never did the picture thingy before. <laughs> we had no clue how to do the proper like lighting, and we we went in the uh, the other way. We wanted to keep the details and underexposed. <laughs> so that's the reason why <laughs> okay. he had to uh, save the pictures. So basically, it's not extremely hard if you have worked in Lightroom. You don't need a lot of experience. You can just be a photographer just, just as a hobby. But if you like to learn prog programs like, I don't know, Photoshop, Illustrator, it's good to learn also the Lightroom because it will have help a lot. From my experience, not only from the photogrammetry, but also as an artist or, yeah, it depends. It's not uh, specific only for photography. So I would recommend running this program. All right. Uh, on one thing. So don't run from that. It's not extremely hard. So if you like, you don't have to specify that you have, I don't know, quite experience in photography. You can just know this program without being a photographer. So yeah. All right. I guess that's I... all for me. That's all. Um, I will switch back now and mm -hmm. I will uh, go with the next thing that we had to do, uh, which is we okay, we didn't use the photogrammetry um, for most parts, but for one part we did. I want to quickly show that. Um, and that is something that Alex Lothar did. So just follow me, Alex. Now this is the object that we had the best photogrammetry scan of and that is also I think it's the, the only object where we actually use the result of the photogrammetry to generate a texture. So maybe you could uh, explain uh, that a bit. Yeah, basically uh, as Rimad just said, this was uh, one of the best models we had. Obviously, uh, as was pointed up before, uh, you cannot use uh, photogrammetry output as a model in a game because it has too many polygons. So what I did for this is use the actual scan as a reference for the dimensions and where all the little things were, were positioned. And after I've done the low res model, I've used the, the texture of the 3D scan uh, and uh, baked it in the low poly uh, mesh. So we had a texture that uh, really resembles the real thing without having all that heavy uh, polygon base. So it's really, really simplified um, compared to that scan. All right, and uh, we can also go a little bit closer here. 
um, because then you can see all the details and you also see all the horrible things that are hunting us at night, like <laughs> <laughs> this yes. mis missing. There's, there's yes. one word that says missing and... Uh, it's, it's on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's there, so just you don't yeah, see it. Yeah, it's flip. Okay. <laughs> so so yeah this I messed up. <laughs> it's all, also it's really cool because um we had uh someone like in the astral uh like last this week uh who like we built up the vr setup exactly here and he could feel the different tiles and uh that was so amazing like like he could really feel those different Uh, tiles together and it was so accurate like like everything is spot on here uh, like to a few millimeters and uh, I, I think modeling just the fountain took you so long it was like weeks yeah. of work right yeah because I I didn't know a lot of things that were necessary to do that, to do that so I had to learn first and then apply them And yeah, it took me a lot of time, but uh, eventually uh, I come up with something. So that's good, I, I think. <laughs> yeah, that was, <laughs> that was a big project inside a project to remodel the fountain. And like, like usually we were never really happy with everything. So we edited it over and over. And then at some point, um, maybe you wanted to tell a bit about what you added to the fountain yourself. Yeah, so um, uh, the fountain was a great model. We then had to get it into the the world and uh, position it correctly, scale it correctly. Oh, yeah. So um, this this is a water shader that I that I wrote myself, and I mean, it's it's very simple. But um, you know, we have a few extra things added into it in order to uh, get the reflections to behave correctly toward the edges where it meets the tiles. We don't want it to look too video gamey. And so um, if you want to know the technical aspect, I use the vertex colors of the water mesh to control the ambient occlusion output of the material. Well, hopefully some of you know what that means, but um, yeah, it's uh, th this is actually adapted from Kanga World, which was um, a world that I made for a friend who made the kangaroo models. And, um, and then of course going through, uh, Alex placed all these spotlights around and so Uh, what I was able to do is then add light entities to all of the spotlights to get them to cast light properly onto the different parts of the fountain, just like the real hotel. Yeah, and close before we publish this, you also added the normal maps, or at least edited yeah. them? Yeah, so the, the, the baked normals, um, Alex made this amazing, crazy model by hand, and, um, and then the, the smoothing, because when you look at a polygon mesh like this, you think, oh, okay, you just make the surface, wrong. There's way more. There's so many dimensions you have to think in. You have to think in the texture dimensions. You have to think in the uh, the, the surface vector. Like the direction that light hits a, su a surface is uh, actually a defined thing. You can change that. It doesn't have to rely on which physical direction it's pointing. And so we had to, um, you know, get all those to be correct um, so that we could then uh, get the real photo scanned asset uh, from the photogrammetry and then transfer the surface details, not just the color details, but also the, like the, the bumpiness of the surface, the different tiles, things like that. Um, now in this version of the world, it's not particularly visible, those kinds of surface bump details, because we have quite flat lighting on this. Uh, we're not really using any directionality in our baked lighting currently. However, um, there, will, there is an ultra mode you can turn on that has a big fat spotlight that shines down on this and reveals a lot of that stuff. And uh, we might also plan on doing a day version, kind of like a maybe afternoon sunset kind of deal. Uh, we're looking into it. And yeah. We'll be able to see it more clearly there with the sun. Uh, yeah. Also, a lot of people don't know that uh, this world is uh, available on Quest now. So yes. um, a lot um, of people can now join it as well. Yeah, it's going to take a little bit more time for us to get all the, the file sizes of everything down to the point where we can also put in all the code, like the, the hotel rooms, uh, elevators, and things like that, because so, the code is surprisingly large um, in file size, um, and we can't do anything about that. Yeah, and by large, so, we mean it's not it's not really large. A lot of people would say, oh, there's nothing, but, but in this giant project, like, every kilobyte is really important. Yeah, I've every single kilobyte, like... Um, the the source project files, uh, I think you quoted it as being 1.7 terabytes? 
Uh, yeah, around that, if you count everything yeah. together, because I do have it on multiple hard drives. And we don't only have one project right now, we have multiple ones. Yeah, we have multiple as well. So. Um, and of course, the final result is 160 megabytes, so thereabouts, right? So yeah um, so yeah. so the unity the final unity project is around 11 gigabytes but the whole project is 1.7 terabytes around that um if mm -hmm. you if you count it all together uh we mm -hmm. do have like ftp traffic because kidron apparently uh like sponsored his ftp server and that caused also a few terabytes in traffic because of uh, all the uh, files we had to exchange um mm -hmm. so i'm not counting the ftp in but uh, the stuff that is on my hard drive doesn't include all the, the files we generated, but uh, most of them. So yeah, and, and then this is, this is uh, what I say is like um, this uh, texture is mostly converted from the photogrammetry scan. And by converted, I mean manually placing the UVs. <laughs> um, did you manually do that? Or did, <clears throat> did you like... Uh... Did you like baked it well, into it? I baked it, so I used uh, the um, um, tools that uh, Blender um, uh, has to make the the UVs um, because th there were too uh, too many uh, parts uh, for me at least to place them manually. So I when I got a result that was looking okayish. Uh, I I went with that, and when I saw something wrong, maybe I I touch up by hand. But yeah, the bulk of the work work is done by software. Yeah, but still, like like this is not like the mesh is not usable from photogrammetry stuff software. No, no. This no, is no. only this is only for sizes and proportions. Yes. So what you do have to do, you have to model all of those details by hand, and try to the make details? it as low poly as possible. Yes. And another thing that also is important to mention is uh, that every asset n is not only modeled once, because uh, that usually is way too high detail. It's also then downgraded. So es essentially, we have like three uh, to four three models. Times. Yeah, three to four times of, of each object in this world, mesh-wise. And so that means different uh, different everything for that, right? Like, you can explain a little yeah. bit more. We can, we can demonstrate that here. So... If you see these little raised surfaces that I'm sticking my hand into here, these are the, lots of these all over the mesh. These are the first to go away when you, as soon as you walk away from the fountain, these disappear. And then as you get even further away, uh, things like the spotlights, like things like these, uh, are the next kind of to go. Um, and so with with every uh, step, um, you know, away from this object, we uh, there's a version of the object that ha removes all of the smallest stuff and uh, replaces it with um, either with lower poly stuff or just just removes it entirely. Uh, and then at a certain point, we completely stop rendering the whole object once you're far enough. But this one's always, this one's is pretty much always rendered uh, so long as you can see it, you know, in a line of sight. Exactly. Uh, because this one's pretty big, yeah. Um, also, if you really look close to it, I think the stools, let's go to the stools because they are a yeah, good yeah. example. So from here, like, okay, the, the loading has quite changed. Uh, to be less extreme but but if you see those are like the holes of that transparent stool they go away if i go a little bit further away further away further away and they're gone yeah, so and you keep going further and then the the bars at the bottom of the stool also just exactly so the little little bars i'm not sure if you see it because the point is that you shouldn't see it but when i look from here the little bars are also gone now so this is the loading where we add <laughs> at the little bars and now at, at the holes as well and yeah and it's for every object uh, like like those couches they have like uh, like a different uh, surface when you look at it it's curvy and everything but if you walk further away it's basically at some point just cubes yeah it just turns into six cubes at, at a distance <laughs> yeah maybe you can say a little bit of, of the lot numbers that we have here so oh, the well, um yeah, so some objects uh, literally have like six different versions. Um, there's a couple of which, which have that many. Um, most objects have maybe three versions. Um, like the stools, for example, like we, we couldn't remove any more polygons from those if we tried because they're so, such simple objects that, you know, at one point you go like, it's no longer a stool. <laughs> um, but, you know, when it comes to, um, to, to stuff like the sofas, you know, they have a lot of sort of smaller uh, 
deformed detail and uh, I'm trying to think what has the most I what is the, your the, what is your uh, triangle count on the different lots as an example um hmm i mean it will depend but triangle count really say let's go to the hedges i know that one off by heart <laughs> so actually we used to have a photogrammetry asset of this that was massively reduced and it honest frankly it looked terrible it was the kind of thing that if you saw it out of the corner of your eye would look okay but not when you actually you know pointed the fovea directly at it but these um this is actually pho photography from the real hotel all of these leaves are real leaves on this real hedge at the actual hotel and uh this has 972 uh tries and i'm using a shader that also shows the uh, the backs of the leaves so depending on the angle you're looking at this it's actually going to have um a, a, you know, probably closer to double to that um but yeah say each of these is about 1500 tries and then we move further away it actually gets down to half of that so what i'm trying to do is uh when i when i work on these models you have to decide at what point do you stop reducing the polygon count for one level of detail model and then move on to the next lovely detail model and my general rule is half so if this is a 1500 here then you walk a little bit further away it'll have 750. walk a little bit further away you go down to uh sort of 300 400 range uh, until this thing just becomes a big blob of triangles with leaf texture on, but you know, at that point you're far enough away that it just kind of looks right still. Yeah, we also have some other extremes where we just uh, went with a different approach, like we're here when you look outside. Um, the, yeah. the, the, those are the cheapest models we have because it's literally just a bunch of uh, planes <laughs> uh, with pictures mm -hmm. on it. Uh, that was done last minute just to have something there. Um, yeah. Because not having anything there would be worse. People, some people enjoy the, the outside. Yes. I can um, show another example just like that, actually. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, this can... is a good example. Oh, yeah. Those are also modeled by hand, by the way. Let me jump on here. Yep. <laughs> Cleaner Wolf modeled these bottles and then rendered them to a texture. And then we sampled different parts of that texture. And, and uh, he went ahead and placed a bunch of planes with those textures on in different uh, places. It looks so good because it's rendered um, ourselves and modeled ourselves. And... Um, 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 something that Cleaner did as well, which is super extra, was that um, the you know, you have, when you render glass, you need to provide a reflection environment to your renderer. Otherwise, the, ref the reflections are just going to be nothing. It's going to look like a cartoon. And the reflection environment he provided to Blender was literally a 360 panoramic image he took in the real hotel. So that's a little Easter yes. egg there for you. Yeah. That's uh, a 360 image I took at uh, Eurofans 25 with the... 360 camera and it was uh, made as an HDR image so it has a lot of dy dynamic range so can be used for reflections <laughs> um, yeah and then also uh, we did some we did some normal map trickery to make it look a little bit round so mm. from so it should uh, work okay from some distance, but if you look close to it, you of course you uh, uh, notice that it's all fake. <laughs> yeah, was, was a lot of things. A, a lot of and things is fake in here. Also, those this mesh which all oh, looks amazing, but it's actually just uh, that's, transparent that's just texture. The texture. Yeah, the good tight texture, and it's also self-made. Uh, yeah, there would be so much stuff that we could add to this bar. There are still no snacks in that uh, glass thing and no no glasses, no cups. We need to look at the coffee machine. Can we just go oh, to yes. the coffee machine? Oh, yes. Let's go to the coffee machine. On the, coffee machine. the other side. Let me, <laughs> let me zoom in on the coffee bones. This one, now the number of level of detail models this one has is actually really huge because there's so many large and small elements in this and uh, a lot of curved stuff. So when you get really close up to these, the curve is almost uninterrupted. But then, you know, you get further away and suddenly, you know, these caps just blend into the glass. And at one point, we don't even have the glass or the coffee beans. It's just, you know, just a block. Uh, so, yeah, these look awesome. Indeed. And uh, something, what, what uh, essentially the pipe, the workflow was that, uh, you know, <clears throat> a lot of the 3D models uh, are made by all sorts of members of the team, and then they come to me for final assembly in the scene. 
So they'll send me the model. Sometimes they'll also send textures that they've worked on. And then my role is to put the textures into the right slots. Uh, sometimes they'll send me separate textures. So, you know, when you have an RGB texture, you also have an alpha channel. And then moving textures between different channels of different files and eventually getting into the engine. So for this, for example, with the material, I also added kind of like a, we have like a, a, a aluminum foil uh, bump map that we've used for a few things. Um, but what it, you can do is if you scale that up really big on, on top of a material, and you make it really, really like a, a sort of a very low strength for that bump map, you can add like warpedness to the metal. So the reflections in the metal here, I'm not sure how visible it is, but maybe over on this side, it's not quite straight. Like the, the sides of the coffee machine have a little bit of bend to them, kind of the way sheet metal on these uh, devices does in real life. A little bit of the old unevenness on them. And it's just little details like that that, um, that really sell, you know, realism. Okay, the, the reflections around this bar could do with a bit of work. The other bar is probably a better example, but um, yeah. But additionally, Cleaner, you you actually got these from photography of the real hotel too, these uh, cabinets and stuff under the bar. Yeah, this is all texture. There's nothing else. This is all self-made texture. This is all made from photos that we took in the hotel. Yeah. Photos, photos. yeah, yes. Mm-hmm. So speaking of the coffee machine, uh, when are we going to get on to talking about the uh, uh, paintings? The paintings? Sure, we you can. Know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah, that that is something <laughs> when we are in, in, on the other yeah. thing. I so I want. I, I guess. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I want to to uh, also like uh, look around here a bit because we do have a bunch of different assets done by different people, um, mm -hmm. and most of the times we had different versions of it, like this stool. Uh, was first done so our project itself like didn't only had those uh, eight people that you see and like like on the banner or you see 10 people but the core team I would call is eight people which you see in the middle of the banner and those are the people who spend like from start to finish on this project a massive amount of time um, like like every day up to like 14 hours or more and then like 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 I personally, I booked uh, like all my vacation <laughs> to work on this and use all my extra hours that I had on uh, that I had like spared up and collected. And then on top of that, like all the weekends and uh, every day after work, like into the middle of the night, I uh, worked on this. And uh, how you also you also did this like full time yeah. for four months. I yeah, I I, uh, I I could have been working on this avatar and getting it ready for for sale. Um, you know, a lot of people really wanted, but I decided no. I've got to really buckle down on virtual ferns. I think for you know a lot of us, we had a lot of friends who were very concerned for our health and what we were doing to ourselves. But I don't think it was necessarily that bad on us in the end because it's only really bad if you feel like you're not getting results. And for us, you know, we I think are, are quite lucky people that we have the, the resources and the time to be able to do something like this. And because we're the people with these skills and you know we have this free time, it's kind of, you know, there's only a handful of us in the fandom at any given time who could pull something like this off. Uh, and so, you know, it's kind of our duty to be the ones who do it because no one else, uh, you know, no one else is really available to, to do so at the, at the time. Um, and especially during a time like this when people really need comfort, it's important we get this done so that, you know, we can entertain people, keep people meeting each other, keep people talking. Yeah. So as a project leader, I really, really like, like, realized that, first of all, we had uh, hundreds of people who wanted to join this project. And that was super awesome. But we had a lot of people just doing different kind of modeling. So what you need for mm -hmm. this world to run an engine is to model everything like super low poly, but it still needs to look super good. And that is a special yeah. skill that a lot of 3D artists doesn't have because they don't have any experience with 3D engines. Yeah. And so a lot of models that we got w were not directly usable. So we had to redo them. And at some point we decided to like shrink the team sizes down. Yeah, we um, got the team down from about 30 people down to like uh, four and in the end about five on the 3D work. Yeah, I, I would and, say um, I would even add another another layer to that. So we had like hundreds of people who are like in theory on our Discord. They had a role assigned and they wanted to help, but they never delivered anything. So mm -hmm. that was just an overhead from the management point of view that we couldn't afford anymore at some point. 
Yeah, it, it's um, you know, it, it's kind of heartbreaking when someone delivers you a model they spent days on. Um, but you know, you have to look at kind of the the reality of the situation. And you know, uh, my, my friend, they they sent me a model they're really happy with, and um, and I just have to say no. I'm sorry. Like this, it doesn't fit the constraints. It, it doesn't hold up when you're close enough. We we can't use this and. I looked at the model file and it's like I can't actually fix this. I'd have to restart it from scratch. Uh, another friend um, sent sent me a file. Um, there's actually someone who ended up being on the team because they ended up getting really good. But um, they you know they they were working on a file in screen share and I was watching them work on it and they asked how can I fix this particular part. And so I, I modeled that part to show them and then I realized that I'd finished the model in the time it took to explain how to fix theirs. And when 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 that happens, you just think. What, what are we going to do? Like, it yeah. takes more time to help people than it does to make it ourselves, so, you know, and that's kind of when I had this de decision that I was getting really stressed from trying to help all these people who are still learning. And usually on a project, I'd want to turn it into a learning experience. But on this project, we just the time constraints were there. We couldn't do that. We really had to whittle it down to just the few people we could train up and, and get. Um, and, and get good at this. Yeah, and this was also something we just learned because in the in the beginning of the project, we wanted to be as open as possible about our project and the progress, and everyone could just join the Discord server, join the voice channel, look look at us working. But in reality, that was too much distraction. So mm. we locked it down, and then working became so much more enjoyable. And uh, yeah. also, the way we work was just perfect. It's, I think, like most professional works, can learn from that, because um, we worked over Discord, and everyone just shared their screen, and we could just quickly, like, I could ask you, "Hey, how can I, how can I, uh, like, access this element?" And you could just look at my screen in a, in a second and just tell me, and uh, mm -hmm. that, like, that yeah. everyone shared the screen. Also, there was a huge motivation factor because you work and you see like five other people working at the same time. I uh, yeah. I put off working for uh, rejoining the game studio I used to work for uh, until this project was done, and so when I rejoined them. Everyone was working from home for the time being, and um, I, you know, I saw their workflow, and it was exactly the same as virtual forensics. Everyone's hanging out in Discord. Uh, when people need help, they screen share, uh, and the way it worked was exactly the same. So I was really surprised to see that we kind of nailed it on that one. Indeed. So uh, let's go. Let's walk a bit around here, because I also want to uh, go upstairs. And check a bit out the area because uh, we also we uh, got some like people who are like joined the team last minute. Uh, mm. <laughs> so what I also there's something that happens in every project I think that is like like built from like people who do it for free. It's like uh, as soon as you're successful with something and you show that a lot more people uh, all of a sudden decide they want to help because you get more attention and. Then you get like people on board last minute who can, for example, they delivered us to this piano, which we wouldn't have otherwise. And this was a last minute uh, delivery that we just could put into engine. Uh, amazing work on that. Um, yeah. But yeah, so uh, what I just want to say that um, the, we show you the core team, but there are so much more people working on this and also people who just, for example, delivered this this one lamp. And we. Lamp. Okay, you made it. We you had remade it in the end, yeah. But uh, we still want to mention people. Um, so we reserved an area in the back. We just didn't have time for that yet. Uh, we reserved an area in the back where we just want to put a big wall and put all the names on that so that you can see exactly who did what part. Yeah. In addition to this uh, panel, we also want to put up screenshots and stuff of, of different aspects of working on the project along with the credits. Uh, over in, uh, you know, through the, 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 the double doors um, past the sec second atrium, uh, there's an area there. Uh, and thanking everyone. Um, we'll, we'll probably get to work on that tomorrow because. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very it's really important. Hectic still. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> super stuff. important. I'm, I'm so sorry that we couldn't do this in time for EFO. Uh, but then again, EFO was just one event in this uh, virtual con space. And we didn't make this for EFO, so we made it originally to give people like a place where they can meet every day. 
so we had this we this, we had this world or at least parts of it online for months now and it, it has become a place where people just meet every day and then efo was around the corner and we didn't knew that efo would happen when we started this it was like what got clear to us pretty late in the progress and then we decided okay we have a deadline now to publish the lobby and having deadlines is super important for a project and we had several deadlines and we nailed it but we na nailed it last minute so it's always always like five minutes before going live that we oh, actually okay. finished it and yeah that was so <laughs> stressful <laughs> the the yeah also the trailer like for the beginning i had one hour to cut this trailer that you see and uh, that was so last minute and then not only the trailer we also had to publish the world and we had a lot of uh, problems in it and then we had to push that live and before the dance competition i had to like on the same day i had to uh, build this as an stk2 world so that people can see the stream from and uh, also fix stuff in the main build and on, on top of that we had two instances with different technique uh, with different technology in it for the stream panel and not fish had to work last minute to get the code in and i had to upload this and oh that was so stressful and uh, the, the whole project was super stressful the stress never ends by the way i just N never ends, that this no. lip is here on the glass but on the other side it's not oh and that's on me. A little easter egg made the base model and then i made this mistake when it's I an easter egg it. yeah also i see this picture that cleaner wolf added in here the, the leaf wall yes. um that was also merged from pictures yeah that's that's basically one uh photo that I use to uh, make this object. So it's yeah, but you cannot just slap. You cannot just slap a picture in engine. No, you have to edit it. You have to optimize it. You have to add different. Yeah, you cut out the alpha channel to make to make uh, the edges transparent. Yes, <laughs> and I also generated an omen. Hmm. Indeed. And I also had to go in and uh, when you get a photo from real life. You, know, you can't just use the colors from the photo in the world because uh, if you go to a lot of worlds or you look at a lot of old video games uh, everything looks very cartoony and high contrast and the re in reality um, if you look at just the surface color of something without any kind of lighting detail or anything it's super bland and so you have to blandify everything um, in order to make it look correct once you add that lighting back in um, and so like you know I, I had to tweak that maybe 10 or 15 times throughout the project to try and get the right uh, blandness of the color so that when you put light on it it has the right amount of color um so yeah it's um there's a lot of back and forth even on the same assets over and over uh, and that's something to learn by the way if you wish to get into this kind of stuff using physically based rendering which is what most game engines use now by default is that um the value of your uh albedo as it's called your main uh color texture it, it needs to be right and there are actually charts you can look at online if you search PBR albedo values you can find uh, charts with different sort of colors you can color pick from that are like recorded measured values from real life of how much light is reflected by a surface and what color it is. Grass for example is closer to yellow than it is to green and it's actually closer to gray than it is to full green. So um, you wouldn't really expect that and that's why a lot of grass in video games and VR chat worlds looks radioactive. It's because they, they think, oh, grass is green, make color green. But no, it's kind of more of a yellowy, grayish thing. Yeah, remind me to show some uh, horror pictures to the stream later when we talk about the lighting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so here you see the whole lobby in all its glory and so many different assets made by different people. Uh, Sistrade is also here. Sistrade, you made a few models. Maybe you want to quickly uh, tell us which models you did. He's currently unmuting. Uh, yep. Um, yeah, I made a few of the models. Um, they were primarily just from a task list that was set for a bunch of the modelers. So I uh, did a few pieces of furniture, the statue over there you can see. Um, I also uh, assisted with the uh, one of the main hotel rooms. Uh, that was... Um, I think the major thing that I contributed in, uh, the bed as well in there. Um, so yeah, just major, well, minor bits and bobs that were um, placed inside the world, so yeah. Also, Alex, you made a few other models and I also see some of them. Maybe you want to quickly. Uh, 
uh, yeah, uh, I mean some other models, um, some of which has had to be uh, corrected, but that one is one of them. The let's go there. Standard. It's a beautiful model. So dispenser. Dispenser. I just want to yeah. kind of point out that each item in this world is is kind of an individual project that had a pipeline of also i had to i had to create a task and i had to deliver the references um i had to give the pictures to kaiju for editing them and then kaiju had to edit them and give them to freeborn and then freeborn have to give that back to the fdp then i had to to give uh, to um put that in in a blender file and give it to the person doing the modeling and then the modeling person has to uh, model that thing and also use the measurements to get it right or the the photogrammetry scene and then in the end that file has had to go back to the ftp to uh uh you here uh who put it in engine and then the materials done yes yeah. and then he had to pack it to give it to me to put it in the scene like like i only had to import at this point it was already perfectly uh, in a package, and, I just drag and drop it and in. And when you're working on props like this, usually in, in, a, in a game environment, you know, you're know you Googling for different reference images, you're putting a whole bunch of different models of the thing together and seeing what parts you like from different real life models and yeah. you know, bashing them together. But here, like, there is no Googling, there's no looking things up. All we get is the reference images that were taken at the real hotel because a lot of these items are one of a kind there's only one of them in the world and uh and the reference images that that you all took were just really good and really useful yeah but also this one here we have this one was scaled down from the original because huge yeah life. how you how you thought oh it's way too big okay normally there's also a different juice spender here which is smaller yeah, a different dispenser here. <laughs> yeah but um but that thing is way bigger in real life if you go down there's a bigger version of it i believe yeah yeah <laughs> not in this world we, we decided oh, okay. to remove the uh the little breakfast uh oh, okay white cube thing but yeah but that's yeah, that thing is like twice the size we we went there again last week and was like it's Whoa. big as a person like <laughs> yeah <laughs> All right, so let's go further down here. Oh, we're gonna do it this way. All right. All right. I'm also. I want to a little bit fly you through the scene here. Don't try that at the real hotel, by the way. <laughs> what do you mean? You mean? Don't don't just jump on the balcony. People get mad at you. Oh yeah. The, the ambulance will get mad at you. That is true. Just giving you a little bit flyover of here because this is just too epic to not show you. The room is still cussing. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, and then we have we have so many things that we are just way too passionate about to not have them corrected, like the rotation speed of this. We went there and measured it again, and it was way faster in real life. And then we saw it way. That's way. That looks just way too fast. So the real thing spins a bit faster here. Yeah, the um, real thing is faster. I've got it in the engine at the real speed, and I'm just like, that That doesn't look, that looks, that looks yeah. fake. <laughs> so we just reduced it. We decided to make it a little bit, a little bit slower. Yeah, it's about a two-thirds, three-quarter speed. All right, and uh, that one was also done by Sistray, the snake. Mm -hmm. And then it was uh, finished by Hayu. I believe you yeah, also I made a different texture. Level of detail models for this. So, the um, this one is actually quite an interesting one because it, you know we we get to choose which direction we want to reduce the polygon count in depending on how far away you are. So when you're really close, there's actually loads of polygons in this. But when you get further away, we first only remove the number of polygons in the like uh, the cross section, and the number of polygons in the curve stays the same. And so it still looks really good even at that next level of detail. And as we go, you know, we go forward, we then reduce the number in the curve, and then we reduce the number in the cross section again, and then finally uh, in both. But um, yeah, it, it's a, it was an interesting one to to work on because that's not actually something that I've ever uh, encountered with making level of detail models before. Is yeah, and that that, that is that is a good example for the weird art in the hotel. 
and we decided to not include some other art because it was just too mm. suggestive. There's or... some that's small and co and complex. Yeah. There's also some that's really really uh, suggestive. <laughs> um, even you know even on the fountain we have all the big kahunas. Yeah. Uh, and uh, even then we don't actually show the water streaming out of them, which it does in the real hotel. <laughs> and then there's an artwork outside which we don't talk about because it would be illegal in some countries. Indeed. So. Um... <laughs> so... <laughs> So we kind of reduced the, the, the spicy artwork in this hotel. Uh, while we are here, maybe we should also talk a little bit of, about programming. But first we can finish the modeling side. And I mean, it's never finished, but <laughs> let's go look, Let's go a bit further to the banner. Oh, shush, it's finished. Well, we also Would cheated a little bit. We also cheated a little bit on those chairs. And oh, we have yeah. <laughs> we have we have funny names in the project for all the items. Those are the spider chairs. Yeah, we have uh, Task Fifty Seven Bad Dragon Statue. We have uh, <laughs> we call this Spider Chair. Um, That's really, also this Spider chair Table. Is much more complicated in real life, and so we just I just took the the chair that Tio made and just made the legs longer. Oh yes. I mean, no one's no one's gonna notice if we don't tell them, right? <laughs> so. Um, Let's go to this banner. This banner was uh, designed by Volvini. And yeah, so it shows the, the core team, but like I said, doesn't show all members. And we want to put um, credit walls here in there to show all the members. And just if you don't know, this is a real hotel. There you have the name. You can Google it. It looks exactly like this. Now. Let's go a bit further to the game because I don't want to uh, miss miss showing that. There was also something done last minute. I'm, I'm so glad. Uh, that was done by Tiger and maybe he's here now. Maybe he can join. Yes, Tiger, are you join. there? All right. And quickly join us and uh, show us what you made here. In the meantime, we can activate it and show how it's done because a lot of people don't know that. So you push the button, then you see the game. And, and each player has to do it separately. Yeah, each player yeah. has to activate it so because of, this this world is like so like like we do so much to reduce the CPU frame time because the Archer has a very bad CPU frame timing on the avatars. So we do everything that we can to reduce our own CPU f frame time, and that includes uh, a very high level of of optimization. And yeah, so. Um, so if you activate the game you can arm the dice by pressing the trigger it becomes uh, red it also has nice sounds which i cannot show i'm very sorry um you saw the dice it lands it gives it a little bit of more spin and then the game actually goes to the next field uh, i want to show it again so you cannot cheat with this dice because it uh, speeds up <laughs> itself it does it adds a little bit of rotation every time you throw it <laughs> because otherwise people would cheat and then you see the question and you can answer the question. And this is um, this is a game where you can get to know your friends better. That's kind of the name of it. Uh, but it's a, the important part is normally worlds that have this type of games in it uh, with different question sets are as big as our world because they have to put in like a large PNG. And uh, Tiger will uh, hopefully soon be here and explain what he did to get this whole game to under one megabyte i am right here <laughs> oh <laughs> i'm standing right in the middle of you hello oh hi yeah um like two weeks ago or something i saw one of those videos that cooper tom makes this really winning winning personality so fascinated about uh um vr chat and i saw this hotel and i thought wow i, I live really close to the astral what's going on there and i saw this is virtual forens i want to help and one of the tasks that were on the task board was make a grid for a game. And there's a very popular kind of game that people like to play in VR chat, and it's called Know Your Friends Better. It just works like rolling a die, walking around these squares with friends and um, talking about the sharing questions. Um, and the challenge here is the star of all of this is the hotel by far. So the game could really not weigh down the download size or the performance anymore. So this whole game is just less than 0.13% of the whole venue. Um, it's one of the interactive elements. And um, I made this 
in a way that it's not a big picture, but we're using something called sign distance fields to make very, very crisp floor art. Um, the grid itself is procedurally generated. The, the, the questions can be loaded from multiple sets and they're shuffled up. I chose a rainbow color scheme because furry is all about inclusivity and very, very closely tied to LGBT IAQ plus. And I chose a font called Open Dyslexic, which is kind of cartoony, but it reads very well um, from many angles. Um, works really well with uh, with with a uh, with a font size that we had at our disposal. And um, so, despite the constant questions from Armaji, was like, "How big is this going to be? How big is it going to be?" Um, I managed to turn in this a little fun game. Um, played it yesterday till 2:20 a.m. with people. It's it's really nice. You should try it out. Thank you very much for letting me be a part of this project. All right, yeah, and you helped us with weird uh, font issues, and that's the kind of stuff that you, like normal persons, are never able to get into, like so hard into the font issues we are fighting in this world. And the chat is currently uh, still having those issues if you type too many different characters, uh, but this game doesn't have them anymore. So thank you so much for making this possible. And uh, as soon as we have the right network functions, which should come soon to VRChat, uh, we will uh, add a randomizer and then you can have different question sets and they are all random and you can play this game over and over and each time it's different. That's kind of the idea here. You also made different designs, which are like, they're looking different. One is, has square tiles, uh, another one is without the zigzag lining, um, but then you decided to go with the zigzag. Which um, feels like a, a real game board, right? And this yes. is this is kind of what I wanted it to feel like. Um, one of the challenges that I didn't know, I'm, I'm very, very new to VR chat, but I have a lot of Unity experience, was that the listening distance isn't very long. So um, when somebody's really close to the finish, people at the start couldn't hear them. But the game board is dense enough, so people will usually be close enough together to hear each other answer these questions. And, what I found is that everybody gathers around the square that's being focused right now anyway. Yeah, so it's also networked. So Cleaner Wolf just uh, threw his dice and his own field lighted up. So you cannot cheat in this game <laughs> because otherwise it's every, everything is local and people could easily just cheat. But uh, yeah, <laughs> now you have to answer the question because it's all networked. Um, fun part about the networking part of things, and that also shows a little bit how we had to dive into Udon to make this possible, the is that, <laughs> yeah, but you, you cannot send data over network from uh, client to master, or should I rather say from anyone to the owner of an object. So what you could do is you could have an object pool and add a lot of overhead to your world. And everyone would have his, their, their own uh, shared variable, but um, yeah, we couldn't afford that. So what we did instead is have one pickup and uh, not not even one sync variable. Instead, we have uh, yeah RPC calls, and uh, we basically I use a stupid tool that I made, uh, which can uh, do something very simple. It's just uh, you put in one function, and then it. Uh, I will just show it on screen. So you put in one function and then it converts it uh, for you to uh, all those different function calls. Um, and you can use it to generate network functions. I also have one tutorial on my GitHub. If you want to raid Majo uh, on GitHub, there you can find it, uh, this tool and you can also find a tutorial linked. And then you can send data in Udon. So um, yeah. <laughs> it's one of the things that we had to dive in really hard, realize that that is not possible in VR chat. And uh, I forgot to move it around. <laughs> Just realizing it's not possible, but we wanted it anyway. And then we made a workaround for that to make it happen, <laughs> which is which is really funny. But it describes our suffering with, with uh, all the problems we had when programming. That stuff just isn't available and you have had to come up with solutions for that. Uh, now that we, I, I said a little bit about programming, I also want to say a little bit about the buttons that you can press in this world. So they basically, they uh, know all your finger bones and all the finger bones can push the button. So yeah, but they they don't really know the thickness of your finger. So it's different per avatar. Uh, it works fine in most cases. And uh, 
the the way it works is that uh, those have different lots as well and if you see the closest lot then um, a script runs that checks your finger bone position and I had to low level implement assigned uh, distance to plane function because that was not available. <laughs> we actually just didn't have the, the plane functions. So as usual you make a Kenny, I have hundreds of Kennys but um, a f way faster way to success is than just low level implementing it and work with dot products. And uh, so the way it works, there's a zone in which the, the finger bones are detected and then I calculate assigned distance to a plane which is behind the button and uh, I have different zones and when I push from this direction I uh, push down all different lots and at some point there is a there's a push down event and then I cannot like push even further it changes colors and if I release there's also a release event at a certain amount at a certain point like you see it and now it's a release event and then you get a different sound for that as well and that is also that is not a small thing that that like got developed over and over and like took weeks to perfection it and it's like just for a single button in the world it could have been just a collider that you can toggle it just we want no we wanted to do the immersion of pushing something physically <laughs> uh so yeah that's just uh one of the things um that took an awful lot of time to code and uh yeah so <laughs> oh, it's not complicated. You but but this is the e it. this is the easiest button in the world we will get to the other buttons at some point <laughs> yeah. and uh, before we leave this room don't show it on the stream but i want the stream to know that there's an easter egg and it's it, it, you have to look up at the buildings above the roof of this room to uh to see it but it's there yeah and in Up some in floor. one of the uh, the one of the rooms there's the related easter egg that if you yeah if you in the top <laughs> floor uh room in the hotel uh there's also a related easter egg if you uh put your ear to a certain wall <laughs> spoiler 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 all right <laughs> let's go on to the club stage oh there's also the paintings as it were oh my god i got pushed yeah, so this painting also shows the textures that we use in the world. It's not a bug, we wanted to have it here because we are f saving on file size to make the yeah. download smaller. So we, we just... do have a lot of the real paintings from the real hotel and some of them are even in the correct places. But um, I was starting to get to the point where I was thinking that I was repeating them a lot too much. You know, we were seeing the same paintings over and over. So I figured what would actually be, you know, kind of fun to, to save on memory, um, but also, you know, kind of introduce a little bit of a guessing game for people so there'll be a lot of textures i mean this one's pretty obvious but some of them some of them are not as obvious and you gotta try and figure out what model uh in any part of the hotel including the rooms could these textures belong to all right now let's go to the queue area where you can get onto the dance stage <laughs> so this is a beautiful dance stage and um, this is also a place where you see some assets that are not made exclusively for this project and there are not very many assets except the apple like that we took from someone else the apple's not made by us <laughs> could have done it but uh, i already had an apple model laying around um that is the microphones here and the loudspeaker assets and uh, the light thing is in the background those are the assets. The club stage itself was modeled by us, and including this one spotlight there, and some yeah. of the assets were bought. And also the shader for the light is not done by us. But, yeah, there's um, metric light shaders. Yeah. Well, other than that, it's all self-made, including the textures and those light cookies on the wall, and uh, it's just amazing. Uh, I want to also fly up here because um, those are actually just cubes with a texture on it. Can you believe that? This is crazy. Oh. <laughs> it's just mm -hmm. cubes and it has a custom shader on it, drawing on the back side. It's so hard. And, uh, too. This is the one room that's not in the correct place compared to the real hotel because uh, to place it in the correct place would be kind of awkward due to the way that things are constructed in real life. Uh, so we decided to move this from being one floor up, way down toward the convention center, to being right here over by the atrium. Um, but if people who are familiar with this stage in the real hotel, you know, you'll know that the, the lighting is set up exactly as it was last year at EF. Yeah, so 
the lighting oh, job you. is just Fitch. so accurate and uh we literally have thousands of lights in the hotel all over the place hand placed uh, yeah hand placed and hand adjusted and everything by me oh really? boy <gasps> And you had to kind of do it twice because we had an early build that was kind of demo and uh, yeah. Mm, yes, the, <laughs> uh, the original again? version of the, the hotel that was just the reception with all the wooden walls that were covering the, the lobby. That uh, that's like uh, com was completely scrapped. Uh, some of the textures were carried forward, but all the lighting, all, all of the you know the placement of things that was you know we kind of put the new hotel in a similar place and then just removed the whole old one. Um, so. Yeah. yeah, let's go to a different place now because the light map editing here is, is not as good as I would like it to be. Oh, shush, it's fine. Oh, no. <laughs> the light map no. We'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> oh, yeah, let's let's go to light map uh, editing. Light maps. You know, any of you people in chat, you ever seen one of those, like, uh, if you see, like, a, a character from a video game, like, their face or whatever, except it's not their actual mesh face, it's just the texture that gets, like, wrapped onto the mesh? You ever seen that and thought, I'm looking at something I'm not meant to be looking at? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a feeling a lot of us get when uh, when we're looking at the, the lighting for the whole world as yeah. just a big texture. And it's like, well, where on this is the thing I need to edit to fix a certain issue in a certain place? I do have a video for that, so I want to play it back while also showing some things that are impossible to fix. So uh, <laughs> let, me, let me quickly pay, play back that video for you. Uh, first of all, to explain why we need uh, light map editing. So this is uh, this is a light map that is unedited, and you can see those imperfections here, which are just not looking right, and also here, and it could look better. So um, I edited the light maps by hand, and now it looks smooth and just so much better. And I had to do this. Yes, really yes. Are. So um, I will just play back a video and uh, how you can quickly explain what light maps are. So there's a few different ways of doing light lighting in games. You may have heard of real-time global camera? illumination. The camera is here. Oh, camera's over here? Uh, he's, he's, they're, sh <laughs> they're showing the video though. But um, yeah, you got a few different ways. Um, for open world games, we tend to do you know dynamic lighting where Everything is real-time shadows, real-time, you know, bounce lighting. When the big light hits a red surface, you want a big red bounce to come off of that and affect the characters and stuff. But um, we, uh, we we don't have the, uh, you know, the time, the, the milliseconds per frame to do that kind of stuff for a project like this. Um, Unity does support it, but it doesn't actually look as good as uh, good old ray tracing. Now, this isn't real-time ray tracing like RTX. This is straight up, we, you know, us working on the project, we just press a button, big render button, sit up for a few hours waiting for uh, everything to be computed, or you know, less time if we only choose a certain area or if we choose a lower sample count. But essentially, we wait for our computer to ray trace the whole level, and then we get to see the result after. And um, you know, this way you can have proper soft shadowing. You can have proper large light sources that cast soft light on stuff. Um, the one thing is that you won't get proper real-time shadows or, or, you know, detailed lighting on characters. But uh, a lot of people in VR chat have tune shaders anyway, which don't pick that up. And we figured that to get the most realistic and um, the most well-performing thing, we would use this baked lighting. And baked means it, it's been pre-rendered. Uh, essentially, it's a big texture or several big textures that get placed on all the different parts of the world. Uh, and uh, it treats the whole world as one big 3D model uh, with, you know, and with that, uh, that 2D spread of all of the different parts of the world and makes a massive texture for the whole world of all the lighting um, as a result of this uh, ray traced rendering. Um, and yeah, what we can do is we can then open up that uh, that texture and, and go well. You know, maybe this area over here is a bit too. Yeah, uh, too that's much that's the part. Shadow. That's the part I want to explain. I also see the video right now that I'm showing you. Um, so what I wanted to do is edit all the light maps so that it just looks better. And it's literally it's everywhere. We um, we wanted to bake the light map on a higher density, uh, which is texts per unit. And that just wasn't possible with the current state of graphics cards. And that is like, yeah, so what, what now? So we baked on a lower texture per unit 
and then uh, I wanted to edit all of them manually and it's, you can see right now that I had to like change the color of a certain pixel and always check how this looks in engine and the light map itself is kind of different so you can only guess where something is in the world uh, it will give you like an estimated position but it will not uh, tell you where it is exactly so um, you have this giant 4k texture which covers the whole world and then you have to find a uh, pixel by pixel which pixel do you need to change to um to fix an error in the light map and you can still see in the world that some spots are not perfect but that's only because we have no idea where that pixel is that causes the problems and then on top of it you have also mid mesh mid mapping which uh, just causes the uh, the mesh look different when you zoom away and there isn't much you can do against this except editing pixels which are technically outside of the boundaries um, so I did that for the hotel room to fix some issues because here you see the yellow the yellow things are kind of the boundaries um, and uh, most times the pixels next to it uh, also affect them and then you have those spots in the world that just don't look good and you want to fix them uh, but fixing sometimes also causes uh, different uh, issues because yeah, it's so dense on the light map that fixing one uh, part can mess up another one, which is kind of what happened here. And uh, yeah, at some point it's just impossible to fix some parts because the pixel density is not big enough. Um, but a lot of things are fixed uh, in this world now. And that was the, the, the whole editing like took two full days. There's a lot of things in this project that just took way too much time, like sorting the pictures after coming back and putting them into tasks. Like only the sorting, like uh, per area, took me uh, more than like uh, 30 to 40 hours. And then I had to bundle it all and put it on the FTP uh, for each to have. And that's uh, like uh, one terabyte of data that was just generated and had to be uploaded and then download it and then edit it and upload it again so um yeah that's <laughs> it was so large on so many levels and uh, yeah <laughs> let me let me uh, quickly stop this video here yeah. and um if anyone in uh, the chat is experienced with uh, lighting in unity you might be wondering why we're not using the progressive gpu light mapper because that one you can actually see a preview of the lighting in uh, almost in real time and the reason for that is um, we're using, you know, VRChat is on an older version of Unity, you know, Unity 2018. And we, uh, the progressive GPU light mapper was very uh, jank, let's just say. It's very early on. So, you know, say under this pillar here, what that light mapper would want to do is it, was, it goes, oh yeah, the pillar touches the ground. No one can see the, the part of the ground that's covered by the pillar. So it, it will treat that as a whole. And it will like basically take the light map from outside the pillar and kind of squeeze it into that hole so that you don't get any kind of shadow, you know, bleeding out from under the pillar. Problem with that is that if this pillar had some tiny seams somewhere, that wholeness would propagate outward in a line shooting out here and somewhere on the wall, somewhere else, it'll start smudging these pixels around in the same way because it, it doesn't know what's inside and outside the pillar anymore. And the, I mean, we could spend time fixing those things, but we just didn't have the time. And additionally, Bakery also uh, is faster. Um, it has nicer results a lot of the time if you're willing to deal with a few, a few of the weird quirks. Um, and it, it wasn't as experimental. Um, uh, it also uses AI for removing noise uh, as opposed to um, Unity, which just does essentially a Gaussian blur. At least that's the only kind of filtering we had available to us uh, in 2018. So... Um, yeah, it was the better option for us. It's just that, you know, there are a few things like um, weird RGB pixels you would get around corners and things that we, we would have to fix ourselves. But other than that, uh, I think it was a good decision to switch to it early on. Yeah, I, I just quickly want to show some horror pictures because it wasn't always working. And that is like, the, uh, yes, neon dragon spooch <laughs> everything. I, I will show it uh, one by one. <laughs> so um, we be, like we never bake the whole scene together. And then, like, a week before we wanted to publish it, was like, maybe we should just start baking stuff. And we ran into a lot of issues, mainly the issue that this world is just way too big to bake at once. Um, and we had to bake it at once for the light probes in Unity to work. So essentially what we had to do is uh, set up fake elements of the floors and just for the light probes to render. And, uh, and then we had 
those bakes, bakes uh, which take uh, each bake takes like three hours um, to bake, and uh, <laughs> then after three hours, what you see is that uh, it's not nice to see, or you see a glowing apple, mm -hmm. and everything in the map is just also has those glowing dots, or that is also something that happened like uh, one day before we wanted to publish. It just lo looked like that, um, and not like that. <laughs> This is a daylight version, by the way. I'm just quickly showing you a few pictures here. Um, we had an issue with white, like really bright white specks just appearing in places, and we, yeah. you know, we wrote to the person who wrote the light mapper, and uh, they they told us, uh, "Have you tried turning on this extra tiny little checkbox in the experimental section?" And apparently, there's a whole extra AI that just finds these white specks and removes them. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, how we scaled our measures. By the way, we have different measurements on the scene, and then I made a picture to explain how you need to scale and then Cleanable scaled the mesh. So, um, there's VRChat, Let, let's... We also got like retreated by VRChat, extremely proud of that. Would you like to uh, <laughs> make an explanation of light probes here or should we skip over that? I'm, I'm just quickly sh uh, skipping to the the hor horrific pictures. Also, that is, is uh, mid-map issues, <laughs> hard to fix. And that is uh, also how, it, how one of the bakes just started to look like. So that's a lot of Minecraft. <laughs> <laughs> or it just was completely overexposed. The main issue we had was just no error at all, but everything was like that. Uh, or that, that's also an amazing picture of like the hor horrific uh, <laughs> thing that rotates being, or that, that looks like it's all, it has all been burned down. Or just the lava found. So we have a lot of epic pictures of failed baking. And that is the most common issue we had, that everything was just, yeah, having white pixels all over the place. And uh, there, could, there can be an, a single item in the scene which doesn't have correct UVs causing this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and yeah, so have fun finding finding that out. Um, so um, I, I'm not experienced with bakery. That was mostly highest part, but uh, at some point, we didn't have the time anymore to, to test things, so we just had to go in there together and I had to <laughs> try to find the issue without having much clue about what I'm doing. Uh, but I actually <laughs> I actually found the issue, and that was amazing. Um, mm -hmm. But the workflow from there on that I found out was working just by try and error was cleaning the temp folder after restarting Windows and then like change a few options in Bakery and uh, yeah, basically back at the TPU level that doesn't overrun your RAM, but also checking that no light map, like no object has um, a lot error or light map error. And then it was also a bit of luck involved. Mm. And uh, <laughs> TPU just quickly is uh, one of the biggest knobs we can turn for how detailed the lighting is and how long it's going to take to process everything is uh, the texels per unit. Texel means texture pixel. Uh, essentially, you can control what resolution you want everything to be at in that final light texture. So, um, you know, if, if you're going to squeeze more pixels in per square meter in terms of the lighting, then you're also going to run into much higher, uh, you know, bake times, render times, and higher memory usage. And uh, that's the issue we had was with the VRAM was it just the amount of uh, ray trace data and things like that. It was just too much for the graphics card in some cases. Um, and yeah, if, if you want to double the amount of detail, it actually takes four times as long to render because it's it's you know, on a surface, it's squared. Yeah. Um, also, we have a lot of cheap tricks in here to, to cut down the oh. frame time cost even more, like no. this lighting. Okay. <laughs> so what Hayu did was he made a custom cookie which had some of the models in here yeah. in the dynamic lighting. So th because <laughs> the diamond moves, this is the one shadowed dynamic light we have in the whole hotel. I think there's one other dynamic light, and it's where the ATM is uh, to kind of give a kick a specular off of the screen. That's about it, uh, and that has no shadows. So this, we, you know, every object, uh, the current state of, uh, you know, Unity in VR is you use a kind of rendering called forward rendering, which is kind of old school. But old school also means that every light, every object that a light touches, you have to render that object in all of its polygons again. So, uh, you know, if you walk into a world with a dynamic sunlight, well, you're having to render all the characters twice because they're being affected by your camera looking at them and also by the sun. And that's essentially just a camera um, with extra steps. So the only objects that are uh, affected by this light that's shining down here, casting this moving shadow, 
is the floor, these two things, uh, and the wall and the awnings, and that's it. But you might notice that there are shadows being cast by these chairs. There's a shadow being cast by these hedges. You know, there's no light behind the hedges, so how's that? Well, instead of including them in, in the calculations for the shadows, I just made the light be a texture. <laughs> so this is a dynamic light, but it's actually projecting a texture. And that texture is a screenshot from the light's position where I've made the places where the chairs and hedges are be black. And that way, it essentially acts as fake shadows. Um, so you know, we're doing a lot of little tricks like that just to, you know, we, we have a lot of texture memory to spare. We have a, a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of that of kind of uh, resources available. It's mainly just CPU. It's mainly just number of objects that we have to worry about. Yeah, um, and to to get the files of this world down, like a lot of just is tile texture. Like this is just tile texture, yeah, but also this is a funny story. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't have. I don't think we have the time for all the stories. I want to quickly also get yeah, to the yeah. rooms. Um, but uh, like that wood texture is used everywhere. Like we, mm -hmm. there's just like, I feel like we have like 10 textures in the whole map and just reusing them everywhere. <laughs> That's a lot of textures, but you nah. could have been more, yeah. When, so. you, when, you, when you look at your average kind of like bedroom with a TV sort of VR chat world, um, that world might often be bigger than in file size than this world. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I, I just spent ages on this optimization work. And even then we got a, a, a long way to go still. I could still do a lot more. So we're going to try and... Uh, with yeah. you know, some updates every now and then really try to squeeze more performance out of this place so that we're able to fit more stuff in yeah so so basically like like one texture can be used everywhere uh in the world like for every wood there's that texture just has a different tiling the same textures in the rooms and uh that's just crazy or, or the metal textures that i just use on every asset which also this gets is the same wood as the hotel door. It's just that on the hotel door, we add an extra layer, which is like a bunch of, of kind of kind of cloudiness over it to give it a bit more variation. But that's just another tiny texture, which we also use on the carpets. So it's um, yeah, crazy reuse. Yeah. So let's uh, quickly now, because we don't have all the time, let's quickly now go to some features that we just wanted to have in the world. And uh, one of that is the working chat system. <gasps> Someone in here wrote already a message. Oh, nice. How <laughs> could that be? Um, so also a byproduct of um, of the physics, because um, I also want to add that, like, I started a program in games, and uh, it's not really related to my job. Also, I'm also programming at work. But I had to, to, like, tell myself how to program and then spend an awful lot of time in the Udon community, which has an amazing dis uh, Discord server. Uh, the Udon Sharp Discord is so helpful. Merlin, her does all the the compiler things like made the compiler to that that you're even able to write in udon sharp um like helped me so much in that time and the shed system is made by the helpful helper who helped us uh, having a shed system and uh, that shed system itself doesn't send messages over network instead it passes ownership of of the object uh to a user who wants to write a message and uh, then uh, at some point changes a variable and um, a sync variable so there's one sync variable nothing else one script one sync variable and uh, almost everything is event-based so you don't have any expensive update loops and uh, that's just an amazing product that just abuses the ownership to uh, to transfer the chat to, to someone who wants to press enter and then uh that owner can change the variable and everyone notice oh it has changed and it also has the user id encoded in the message and then uh the the message is basically read by the clients and added to the chat as an as an object um now what i did is i did uh, almost all the physics stuff in the world and also that you can push the slider and it's just it's so satisfying <laughs> so satisfying to push stuff in vr now this is absolutely not not needed for like for our world but i i, I just wanted to go with maximum realism so it was worth it for me to spend months on this on all the physics coding and uh, yeah, we even have a custom drag system because the built-in VR, uh, VR stuff just has a highlight that I absolutely don't like because it breaks immersion. So um, so what we have instead is you, you can grab this with your trigger. Oh, and now I'm 
also changing the camera. I hate the stream camera so much. Please fix. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so you can grab this with your trigger button and then move it around. You can also, uh, which was one of the hardest things to code, you can ju just like make this as big or small as you need for your avatar so that all avatars are compatible with our world. And then you can physically push the buttons. And this has almost no frame time impact because it's optimized. But like getting to the point to have that level of optimization, because each of those buttons has different zones. You also have like, you have a zone for pushing it slightly down where it doesn't act like, like it, this is basically a physical switch. So you push it down a bit, little bit, nothing happens. Then you push it down to a certain degree, like 80%, and then it clicks in, and then you can still push it further. And then you can release it, and only at a certain amount of pressed in, it re really releases the key so that you can press it again. And that avoids you to accidentally uh, spam the same character multiple times. And this is so satisfying to code. It was not needed for the world, but um, y now you have a shared system where mute and deaf people can... Uh, also talk in the world. I think that is absolutely needed uh, for a social experience um, to, to include everyone. And um, yeah, so we just wanted to have that here and now you can chat in the world. And this keyboard is, I don't want to to like, like sound a little bit too much, <laughs> but uh, this keyboard is probably from what I heard better than most built-in keyboards in, in VR tools. I'm not sure which VR game or tool has a better keyboard which is more usable, where you can type that fast. So I'm really proud of this, but this is months of work and dedication and optimization and so many different versions that just didn't perform well enough. <laughs> so you have a working keyboard, you put it in Udon and then it's just too much of a frame time impact. <laughs> um, to get this to better perform, there's a lot of optimization steps like where you don't even run code. There's just one script for the whole keyboard uh, <laughs> and there is, um, well, a lo lot of shortcuts, basically, where your fingers are. And um, yeah, so it's very cool. And the design part of it, also important, we have uh, Kaiju who, who also did a lot of design work for this uh, world. That is, for example, one of the designs that he made um, so that uh, the, the keyboard as well. And then the, that was modeled by uh, by their design and then added also the little bit of uh, explanation here how you can move it. Now let's go to the elevators which are probably like at least from my perspective the elevator were uh, <laughs> kind of the, the oh most complex parts and I need to now get uh, quickly back and grab a key card. Now we do have still 15 minutes uh, for the stream so I want to use that time to show a little bit of the elevators. Um, the elevators itself are modeled by Hayu. How much time did you spend on modeling? That was two whole weeks. It was like a crazy Lego puzzle. Oh, yeah. Like, and I, I think I can top that by how much time we spent on the elevators because it started mm -hmm. really early and the coding went on till the end. So it's roughly about uh, three months of coding. <laughs> and and uh, at, at w one point, um, uh, Notfish joined uh, the, the team. And he helped me with the networking part of it um, because I still I wanted it to perform even better. And he added all the bit shifting my magic to it and helped me debugging when I ha when there was a problem. And it's so good to not code alone uh, <laughs> if it's so complex. And uh, uh, the bit shifting basically reduces all the function calls, so we directly uh, change a certain bit. And the whole elevator and room booking and so on system. They use two float values. You can find the whole code on GitHub if you're interested in that. Um, the ATM is also part of it, so you put it in. And then you can select a uh, room on the touch screen. There's our Laden meme. <laughs> and then you can choose a payment provider. And then you get a room assigned and you can take out the card for them. That is your card now. It's global, okay. everything is synchronized. Oh, someone already pressed the elevator keys. Those are also Your physically. Code. The Let me QR just... code on the um, on the ATM uh, works as well. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go also to the ATM real quick. That is just an amazing model. It looks so realistic. Also done by Hayu. And there's also stream available where you can see how that was modeled if even you want the, to. Uh, even the like scuffing of the material here is exactly as it is in the real hotel. Yeah. And now the elevator's here. Let's go all inside. 
Um, um, I, I would love to... Oh, no, no, no. Open the door again. I want to show the door closing. That is so satisfying to look at. Um, let, let, let the door close. And oh, yeah. look I at spent, all those different door quite parts. Quite a while. I spent quite a while, like, tuning the... Uh... Oh, come on. You can do it. You, you can also force the closing. Yeah, just look at the different yeah, parts closing. Getting the, like, animation curves so match good. up with the real one. <laughs> yeah, and now we can go to the first room. And all those buttons are also physically, because everything is physical for maximum immersion. And, and that button can, for me is up here. can also activate a mirror. And there you saw the teleport, which is a, a hack that we had to use to get all the floors in the world. So at some point you basically uh, teleport with all players and it's synchronized so the way it works the way every button works is like um, you send a function call which has the the floor and the, the button and everything encoded and uh, you send it to master and master has that one float value where everything is encoded and the master decides okay let's bit shift this uh, this bit in there now to flip a bit and that flip bit has uh, the information that this button is pressed and that's how all the buttons line up on all the players and another thing that is uh, also in there is um, that the master encodes uh, the number of the floor um, that the elevator is currently at because you can see those custom uv shaders and you can see the elevators moving and if i just uh, open the elevator again and send that elevator to uh, floor 13 then you can see it changing after it closes and um, There are a lot of tricks in this world like to get this done and this is also custom made uh, by high the shader on top and The coding for that is a little bit special because technically a lot of things uh, We don't want to have it multiple times in the world like we don't want to have once one button script for for one floor button or one script per door so the door exists only once in the world um, all those uh, button presses exist only two times the reason they exist two times and not one time is that um, i wanted it to be able that you can chill in a room and see the elevators um, opening when people walk in and that decision means that everything was twice as complex to code <laughs> not a good decision maybe um, but uh, now you have that as well and um, basically everything else like the elevators they only exist twice and they are only rendered or existing when uh, you need them so the elevators are essentially not there if you like look in there now um, they are not there <laughs> so uh, yeah only when you really need an object is rendered like we are staying here now and uh, even this this night this yeah. sign at, and the new room sign is like it it's taken with you to each floor you travel to. There's only one of this. We just changed the, the, the part of the texture that renders on this uh, to show a different number when you go to a different floor. Yeah. And um, so like like the, the controller part of that is just very complex. And uh, we run 25,000 lines of code in this world. Um, now, one very complex part was this door, and this door is, uh, you, you hold your card basically in front of it, and if it's the right key card, the this, this door is unlocked and you have nice sounds. The sounds are done by Esla and Soundwave, they travel to the hotel, um, and there was like a 10 hour drive for them, and they made like professional recordings. And then um, I cleaned the recordings up in auditions to make them like clean of any noise and to make them sound uh, exactly like I uh, wanted it in the engine. And um, then I coded like that the physical part that you can like push down this thing here. And I also made like a first draft of that you can push the door open. And then I didn't have any time for that anymore because I had to work on the light map issues. And uh, that at that time, Notfish took over and he programmed everything um, further than that. And he did a different approach of physics. So he goes by velocity of a bone. And when you interact with, with the door, the velocity transfers to that. So now you can do different things. And the coolest thing you can like, <laughs> you can kick the door open if you want to, uh, just a just a super cool feature you also have you have sounds for everything recorded at the hotel so it sounds totally realistic you can knock on the door and the knock is in almost in real time transferred over network and everyone has that sound then the doors also 
uh, network synchronized, but we don't use sync variables or pickups for that because it would just be too expensive. Um, and uh, because all of that would require us to essentially have the same door 13 times in the world doing coding stuff, and that's just too expensive. So we have one door, uh, which is all run in code, no physics whatsoever involved in this. And uh, it's also network synchronized by using the tool that I made to generate the networking code. And uh, yeah, so if you close the door, how you? Um, so the moment that he moves the door over a certain point, um, the door sends a function call basically. And that lerps the door on my side to the position. Um, yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> that is uh, very interesting. So it's kind of synchronized. And you can do a lot of stuff like uh, the, the but the state controller of this is also amazing. So I can uh, close the the door. Basically, I can push this ledge. At least I couldn't. It's somehow got harder since the last update. But I I can push the ledge in, and now it's in a state where it would close. So if I kick it closed now, and it goes in the locked position, then it's closed, and that's also transferred over network so that you're safe from other people in your room. <laughs> And those, oh, those but, uh, buttons are also an interesting point. I coded them in like a few minutes and they look so satisfying. They look so perfect. Even so they are like, uh, yeah, so simple. So basically what happens here is um, you push the upper or down part and you see it moving, but they don't really move. They just flip the object of the button 180 degrees around. So that's everything. So just do again like a sign distance to plane projection from the finger bones, and then at some point decide to uh, make the click. And uh, yeah, so <laughs> they just rotate. It's it's super simple. Uh, Trev, like pickups in the elevator that gave us a few days of work to like fix after we had to reposition the rooms to be under the hotel. So that was kind of a horror story to tell as well, <laughs> getting that to work again. Um, yeah, who knew that with a lobby and a bunch of rooms that, that go up uh, half a kilometer into the sky, you would be able to see them from yeah from the lobby. <laughs> right. So, and we also couldn't we also couldn't place the room somewhere else, like on the sides, because um, it, so many VR chat bugs that I had to discover and try to work with. Uh, one of them was that teleporting is completely broken in some states. And even in like like outside of the update loop, you cannot really teleport a player. That just leads to weird uh, events. And even in update, uh, you cannot really teleport. Like it doesn't always work. So you always need to check, did it really work? Or did VR just teleport the player like a few meters on the wrong spot? <laughs> so you would end up, your character would end up being outside of the elevator or you would be end up and then ending up outside of the elevator so so many bugs that are just in there and then we had to work, live with and find a solution or work around for that um now we are coming to an end now but i at least want to show you the singing engine so that you get an idea how that looks and uh, i also want to show you like this is how you do stuff you make a stupid paint draft of it <laughs> and then you <laughs> try to from work from there and try to solve the math around that. Um, so let's open up this thing in uh, Unity. So I need to like put off, uh, like like switch off a few effects so it doesn't look so fancy. Now when I look at the elevators, the elevator controller, it looks kind of like that. So you have all the different audio sources. You have all the different colliders. Turns out you need to use primitive colliders for that to work properly in VRChat. You have all the zones in which we do bone calculations. And it's just very complex. Um, <laughs> if we look at the keyboard, I think that is the... It's about uh, getting the square root of the logarithm and then multiply that with P and then you have the vector of the matrix. It's that yeah, so I just want to want to um, show you something which is terrible. Uh, so <laughs> all these assignments for every button I had to design three objects. I had to do this twice, and because everything got lost at some point here, and so <laughs> just assigning all the buttons, like for the elevators, assigning the buttons can take multiple hours, <laughs> multiple hours of work, and we lost. Oh. <laughs> We lost the how about we add more? Sorry, how about we add more buttons to the keyboard? Some numbers, maybe. Who knows? No, 
<laughs> people have been asking. Also, by the way, people have been asking and repeating the same question. Stairs to the ATM. <laughs> no. <laughs> we cannot okay. move the ATM up and down. I mean, I can I can try. I can show you how that looks. Where are like. my little stairs? <laughs> it must to... be at least this tall to use So look, right. look at this. Look at this. If we would move the ATM up and down. Do you want this world to look like that? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so yeah, we could um, fix it it's just there's more you know there were always higher priority things uh compared yeah. to how hard it would be to fix that oh i also want to quickly point out that the the whole um like the roof structure of uh this hotel was so complex because you would think that you could like copy paste like this roof element to that nope you cannot because everything in this hotel is different like you can see those have like three bars in the middle and those have two bars so cleaner wolf had to make a different um different version for that also those are different on both sides of the hole um then we have like weird elements in here which are like they have all of a sudden only like two bars and then half an element <laughs> and if you would think that this is a mistake from us no it's not this is how the real hotel looks like and i always wonder what what happens because it can just rain in there uh so <laughs> yeah but, but like so, there's so much details in the roof that's so close to the real one it's just an amazing job atrium with the air vents in it as in the real hotel it has intersections and the other one has only three but to save some polygons we made it three intersections for the whole roof so. yeah but everything is a level kit so um that is like one element and a level kit and then that's another one and we just instance yeah, obviously we try to uh, optimize it in a way to reuse as much elements as possible and to install stuff so that wouldn't take too much memory. Yeah. So the, the whole structure of this roof has less polygons than one uh, standard avatar in VR chat. Um, maybe higher, you, you know a little bit about that. I know that at the beginning, uh, Cleaner Wolf made this model in such detail and it had 160,000 polygons, I believe. It, something like that. You yes. Know, it, it had a... It had, you know, maybe four regular avatars worth of polygons or uh, maybe one very chunky avatars worth. And um, yeah, essentially you know, every window was separate, every bit of glass. Uh, we also had uh, divisions um, be between all the, every, every uh, piece of roof structure, like the struts, uh, was sort of had a, a polygon for every division as well. So. Uh, I basically took the template from Cleaner Wolf's model and uh, took uh, took a lot of those polys out and just stretched them out so that they would become. Um, you know, it's nasty. The topology doesn't match up. Things aren't uh, things aren't you know welded the way that they would be usually. But anything for uh, for trying to minimize the number of polygons. So a lot of long stretched out polys that um, yeah that, that, that traverse a lot of the structure. Yeah, but then you also did shortcuts like to save polygon counts be because it also is heavy for the CPU. Uh, you have like, this is part of the texture now instead of being out of polygons. Yeah, so um, exactly. Be before uh, it was a, a polygon would represent the sort of sealant, the like a black strip that uh, surrounds the, um, the glass panes. And um, we really took out a lot of polys by uh, baking that down to a texture. So we treated the, the original model as a high poly, and we treated the new model as a low poly, and we, we baked the texture down. So um, that really saved a lot. And uh, we reused that material quite, quite a lot in all the different roof elements. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing just, just how you managed to get this down to basically one avatar with like 16,000 polygons or so. And... Uh, just so much optimization to also have this as one glass uh, element instead of multiple ones. Every polygon was basically saved where it's possible here. And yeah, that is so interesting. Uh, here you can also see now the wireframe of everything. You can also see a little bit of uh, the loading working here. And basically what you can see is it's a very low poly everything, but it still looks good. And when you come closer to it, it adds more polygons. 
and that is just an uh, like incredible amount of detail and uh, for the glass roof like you would normally think why would a normal avatar need to even have that in there but uh, we we have in the community we have people who are like um, bigger than the the hotel basically and we wanted to also give them um, a place in our world and uh, so everything also looks good from the top which is normally not not needed um, but yeah if you have like avatars which are bigger than the hotel then you want to have that in there that's a concept yes um, now we are kind of at the at the end here from the stream we have like one minute to go and uh, I want to quickly end this now and just uh, from my own perspective uh, this this project is not over it's um, basically just uh, started and uh, there's so much stuff that we want to add to this uh, not at the same speed because we are completely broken now and we just need rest and vacation stuff like that but uh, yeah basically uh, this must go on and we need to improve it and I want to add some features that I didn't manage to finish in time and we will work on this we will try to bake it with a higher TPU well, maybe maybe the next lineup has an affordable GPU with uh, the needed 20 gigabyte RAM. <laughs> we will see. Uh, but um, yeah, we want to expand this world. We want to add uh, more details. We want to further improve the frame time costs. Um, and we also want to add more features like more game modes and stuff to that. So um, expect, expect more updates in the world and this con will never end. It just started and... Uh, it started a few months ago and just only getting better. So um, well, enjoy the so stay. The concept is to bring the community together in this world. Yes. And if you are able to do that, to uh, uh, people have fun and enjoy it, it was absolutely worth the effort. And almost 20 uh, years ago, I made the Cleaner Wolf model for Quake 3 Arena. That was. Uh, the game-related uh, project that brought me into the furry fandom. Uh, and now it's kind of the circle closes because I'm involved in the game project. Yes, again. we need to quickly end the stream here. I uh, just want to again say thank you for everyone involved so far. And I know like people will stay here and we will improve this in the future. And we will further add more details. And it was an, an amazing time so far and I'm looking forward to the future where we update and further improve the world. And don't forget, this con is not over today. It, it just goes on and on and you can uh, join here every day. So thank you so much. Um, I know the, the EFO stream will end at this point. We will further stream at Virtual Ferns and show you a little bit more of the coding details. And uh, yeah, so goodbye EFO and uh, on Virtual Ferns on Twitch, we will keep going a bit because I want that everyone has the time to say what they want to say. I know Sistrate also made the uh, soft modeling part of this. So maybe you want to say, tell a bit about how soft modeling works. Um, so mainly for the soft modeling, specifically the bed that we're sitting on here, um, I did a physics simulation for the fabric. So you model a basic model of what the uh, blanket or the pillows would be like without any interaction and then you run a simulation have it fold or or fluff in a certain way and then you bake it and then you put it into a low poly model and yeah it's essentially um made by simulation so yeah, awesome. runs mm. 